So the first objective, um, and so we'll just go with number seven and uh, number eight. And actually, I'll jump into number eight here because <clears throat> number eight uh, ends up, what it's telling you here is that um, there's, a, uh, there's a Windows function. So there's a Windows system function that is used by the uh, executable. <clears throat> I made sure in this particular case that the code I added that calls that function is the only code within the executable that actually calls it. <clears throat> so what you're supposed to do here is use um, that Windows function as kind of a breadcrumb to lead you back to um, the point in the code that calls it. <clears throat> so what it wants to know is what's the address of the function. So there's a function that ends up calling message box A to produce a message box. And um, usually you can do like this, Windows, message box A. Um, and if it gives you docs.microsoft.com, that's where all of their OS documentation is. So most of you probably went through this, but the, what's really helpful is it gives you this uh, function signature here that tells you which parameter corresponds to which data. So <clears throat> what you need to do is you need to find out um, where that function is called in the code. So one of the approaches to do that is to go over here to the symbol tree. So this is the way to do it if you want to just only use Ghidra and use the features in Ghidra to do it, um, is to go over here into the symbol tree. And what I will do is I'll actually pop this out. So you can drag these windows around um, if you are having trouble seeing them. And what it did is it put it on top of the disassembly view. So now it's tabbed just like this one over here. Um, so the imports, what that does is it has a list of all the DLL files that this program wants to load. So the DLLs that it wants to ask windows for. And then underneath those, because these are all trees, it'll have the list of all the functions. So what you can do in this window, um, and many of the windows in Ghidra work this way, so you can see over here under data types, there's also a filter. Um, you can actually put message box A, you can start typing it, and it'll filter the list down to only the libraries that have it. So once I'm there, what I wanna do, so I know that I now have confirmed that what I wrote in the assignment is valid. The function is called uh, somewhere within this program. So then what I want to do is I want to go to show references to this. So that's one way to do it. So I can do this or control shift F. Um, that brings up a little dialog box like this. Um, it's kind of a, if you remember when you we were walking through during the lecture, <clears throat> you could see the uh, references were listed on the right hand side in the disassembly view. So when I'm looking at the listing view over here, um, if I see something, so the other thing that's nice about this um, is, is that uh, it also jumped the listing view to where that message box A was located. So then the message box A has this reference listed over here, um, just like those strings that we uh, were looking at in the previous lecture, right? So it has a little uh, cross-reference um, uh, thing over here. Uh, so what I can do is I connect, if, if I hover over it, um, I'll just hover over it really quickly, because it gives you the, that gives you a giant pop-out of a preview. So that's showing the code within this program that actually in the line in the middle of it, so the line where it says call EAX, there's a highlight right there. Um, that's the spot in the code where this function is called. Um, but of course it's disassembly, so it's a, a little bit cryptic to view. So this right here, this table, when I said show me the references to it, is basically showing me the, right, the same thing. So it has this listed right here and you can see context computed call. Um, this, this one down here, anytime that you're looking for a function that's external to the program, um, it'll show you two references to it. 
Uh, one ref, or it'll show you at least two references, I'll say that, um, because the function may be called multiple times. Um, it's always gonna have one of these data references, and the reason for that is that the program has to have data stored in it somewhere, so it has to have a data structure in there um, that basically tells it what that function is that it's trying, that it's gonna use. So the, almost the signature or the reference for the function has to be stored as data itself. Just like in C, if you are making a pointer to data, you really have two variables. You have the memory location that contains the array of data like the string, and then you have another variable which is a numeric variable that's the memory address at the beginning of that string. So the same principle here applies. Um, you have the code that's actually calling that DLL, and then you have the, oh, excuse me, and then you have the address um, where the reference to that DLL is located. So um, that gives you a nice little table view, but the exercise that we did last week um, where we were looking at strings, they basically use the same UI for uh, uh, function calls as well. So this is right here, what I'm looking at is the data that's describing message box A, describing the function message box A. So it's actually storing a pointer to it, so it works very much like the uh, string example I gave you. And I can double click on this. <clears throat> and then what that does is it jumps me into the assembly code that was previewed for you earlier. And when it jumped me into the disassembly that was previewed for you earlier that has this call to that function within that DLL, it also made the decompiler view follow that exact same thing. And for any of you who are having a similar problem to what I'm having, which is screen resolution's too small and I can't see the decompiler, I can drag it over here if I want um, to get a bigger view. Um, you know, or I can even you know, kind of do something like this and I can drag it down here. Uh, I'm gonna close the console view for now. Um, but yeah, I can drag it down there. Uh, later on I can figure out how to tab it if I want on the bottom here. Um, but basically, this is going to, yeah. So if I ever scroll it off the screen, I can double click the line again and then it'll anchor it back. It'll make my uh, decompiler view jump back to um, where it was before. So the first question it said was, what is, what is the address of this function? Um, so one of the easiest ways to do that is just to scroll up here to the top of the function. And um, <clears throat> so the way that Ghidra computes the addresses is it actually stores them in the name of the function when it doesn't have an alternate name for the function. So the address for this function is actually that string that I have highlighted right there because it's the function that calls this. So basically, I looked up message box A in the filter, right, in the, um, in the imports view, in the symbol tree, using the filter here. And then I was able to double click on it, which caused my listing to jump to um, where the pointer to message box A is located. I scrolled to the right on it, just like we did with the string example when I was trying to figure out where is that string used. And then that jumped me to the beginning of the function, or that jumped me to the uh, to the end of the function, actually, the function that was calling message box A, which is right here. Um, the next thing is, at what address is it called by the malware? So we know that we know the first address of the function, right? That's the address of the function. That's the first address of the uh, first instruction in the uh, function. The address where it is called is right here. And so this call instruction is at this address, which is a different address than the one that's right here, right? It's this plus some additional numbers to get you all the way to the end of the function. So that would be the, this right here would be the answer to the second part. And then the message gives a title and message to the message box call. What is the text contained in these two arguments? So this is where looking up the documentation on Microsoft's website comes in really handy because there's a title and message. Um, it says text and caption. If 
but basically the same thing if you, um, the window that pops up is going to have a caption, that's the title, and then it's gonna have text in the middle of it. <clears throat> so, if I scroll all the way down to where message box A is called, there's this local underscore F2 and local underscore 107, which are variables that were created. Um, so then we need to figure out what strings those uh, uh, what strings those refer to. So, oops. So what you can do is you can see that this one's a little bit more complicated, but um, what it did was, I'll scroll up here, you can see that there it did this similar kind of, um, or not similar breakdown, yeah, it did a similar breakdown of the string right here, right, um, as the example that we uh, did in class the other day. And so you can follow, you can watch as I'm clicking this down here in the decompiler. It's actually walking through each one of those as well. <clears throat> the nice thing about this, and yours um, may oops, sorry, yours may still look like this. Yours may look like this, right? So yours may come up looking like that with some sort of number at each one of those lines. Um, does anyone remember, like, did yours look like that when you first opened it? So following the example that we, uh, or kind of using the same approach that we did in the example, you can go down here to the converter. Um, I think actually it was probably hexadecimal, but, um, you know. <clears throat> but in general, you can go down here and you can hover over it and it gives you what this would look like in a character sequence. So you can make a pretty good, really quick sanity check by just right clicking on it, go into the convert menu, and then looking at that character sequence and seeing if there's actually a bunch of uh, characters listed there. So what this ends up doing is the same thing that it did before, which is there's one, two, three, four, five. So there's five lines and uh, four characters on each line. So it makes a 20 character string that is that arbitrary value here. And then, so that's one of the parameters. And then the other parameter is this one up here. So you can see this local F2 is referenced up here. Right here. Yep. This one gets a little bit more complicated because uh, I think well, so one of the things that you'll run into sometimes, and this is why it's really helpful to have both the disassembly and the um, and the decompiled C, um, Geezer does a pretty good job of mapping the disassembly directly to lines of code, um, but it's not exact, um, and so you do sometimes have to kind of second check it. Um, what it's, uh, you know, but basically what um, you find out is that um, and I'll, I'll be honest, this um, example is not designed to like trick you up or anything, so I didn't throw a bunch of strings in here that are the wrong answer just to get you to chase them down. Uh, what you can see from this is that there's really two strings that are that are put together. One of them is a is a data pointer that's right here. So you can actually go to wherever this is and you can actually read the data. 
Um, so there's one data pointer there that the decompiler does a pretty good job of deconstructing. And then there's this value, which you end up having to manually do the uh, conversion. And unfortunately, they don't have uh, the conversion. Let's say trying to convert this number into a string in the um, in the decompiler output would violate like C syntax, which is the reason why they don't allow you to do that there. <clears throat> so you end up having to do it up here, and you end up having to build these three things to, or these uh, five strings together. Um, so you end up identifying that there are two strings, and then it's a matter of figuring out okay, which of those two strings uh, refers to which argument when you call message box A. Um, and that's where you basically have to go through and you have to figure out which one's being loaded into which variable. And ultimately, what you end up finding out is that this one right here gets loaded into this, it basically comes right after that, or, or right after building the string. Uh, and then this one loads a value that was prepared earlier on, uh, which is uh, further up. So I'll show you. Yeah. This one ends up being rep uh, the only one connected to the reference to local F2 up there. So, so to some extent, it's a, um, uh, it's just kind of a matter of trying to figure out where are those variables uh, connected into the uh, assignment code in the disassembly. Yeah. Yes, so next step, I'll bring the source code up. So let me see if I can remember. So this one ended up being the the function number, I think the one that number seven was asking about, right? Or no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one that number seven was asking about, moves a bunch of data. And then this one ended up being the message box calling function. So it's literally just copy data into a buffer um, copy the second one into the title um, and then call message box A. Yeah. Okay. Um, for this particular one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this right here. This is So uh, what you can do is it has this uh, uver, um, uvar variable, which is defined up here. That gets OK. So what it is doing is p uvar, so the pointer 
this is this var three is a pointer to the string, right? Variable four is a pointer. Uh, we'll just say to an empty buffer is what it looks like. Uh, probably. Let me see if I can find that where it's uh, defining that. Um, yeah, local variable on the stack on the heap. Um, and so what this is what this is doing in a nutshell right here. Um, and this might just be a compiler specific um, optimization or a um, uh, it might be like a safe coding type of um, practice that's thrown in by the compiler. I don't know the purpose of it. But the um, this string constant um, really kind of lives in like um, let's say like global scope of the program. So most of your string constants when you compile them in C, um, they go into basically a big string table. Uh, that lives in a global space within the program. So basically any function can address any string that you have written in the source code. Um, what it's doing here, oh, oh, and then I'll say that, I'll go on to add. Because of that, all of the string constants in your program are usually in read-only memory. Um, I'm gonna make an educated guess as to why it's doing this here. And I think it might be because, go back here. It might be because I put a character buffer. So I defined a character buffer that's a read write um, array. Uh, and I put it on the program stack here. So you can see it's the character buffer with the brackets instead of a char star. Um, that means that I defined a character array. And I also made it read write, which means that it can't just make it an alias to the global string, the global copy of that string. So what the compiler is doing is it's making a local copy of the contents of that string with that while loop. So that if I wanted to write code within this function that went in and edited some of the characters, it would be able to do that without violating like read only, uh, read -only memory exceptions and stuff like that. So. That's going to be my guess as to why it's doing that. So, but this is a good example because it's um, it's a example of um, there's going to be a lot of extra code that's thrown in by the compiler on pretty much every single program that you are supposed to analyze, <clears throat> and um, you're going to have to figure out how to kind of bounce around that stuff and identify the key breadcrumbs within the function that really answer the questions you're looking for, which is, in this particular case, you might be asked, hey, what does this function display to the user? And in that event, you will want to be able to walk through here and, um, you know, basically pull out the handful of lines of code, so basically the 20% of the lines of code in here um, that are responsible for presenting something to the user and ignoring all the extra code that was thrown in there by the compiler. Um, this is actually a much kind of, I know it has some extra stuff in here that's kind of unintuitive when you look at the original source code. Um, we'll say that the, uh, the problem is magnified even further. <laughs> um, when I typically am dealing with malware that I have to deal with that didn't come off of someone's like GitHub project. <laughs> so, um, you know, so for anyone who ran into it and was kind of like, you know, for instance, that's a really great question. Like, why is that while loop there and everything? It's a, <clears throat> there's all these little tiny semantics about the C programming language that, um, that are basically ingrained inside of all the programs that are written. And they're typically completely um, opaque to you unless you have to go in and analyze a program you don't have the source code for. So this is that one. Um, and then that's kind of why I threw the hint down here. Use the imports branch in the symbol tree to help you track it down. Um, and then the other one uh, was basically, you know, I'll be honest, this one, um, really the only my only expectation for this one, I'm going to put this back over here. Um, 
my only expectation for this one was literally you could go through here and you could walk through the de walk through this while you have a view on the decom on the decompile output and basically just step one after the other until you come across something that looks like a really long line of moving data from one place to another. Yeah. You want to know what the source code looks like? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so for future reference, I won't throw any curveballs like that at you <laughs> without actually telling you that expect this. So like for the, um, you know, for the one coming up in the, uh, later on this week, um, there will probably be one case on there where I'll like have to, you know, I'll have to add on there like, you know, there will be a modification to this program. The modification of this program is code that is one of the five functions in this other program. Tell me which one of the five functions is used, like that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I won't like say, hey, um, you know, go look at this and tell me what the string is, and then, and then, haha, you didn't get it because it's actually base64 encoded or whatever. Like I had that one as base64 encoded, but you weren't. The answer wasn't the decoded text. You could give me the decoded text, and I would ask. I would uh, accept it. The answer was really the base64 string, and it was just a. It's kind of like a nice flat string that was um that like would stick out, I guess. <clears throat> so, but basically, the lab work's going to try and keep up with whatever I talk about in the lecture. So, like, if we don't talk about obfuscation and stuff like that much in the lecture, then I'm not going to throw an obfuscation like problem at you or a deobfuscation problem at you in the lab. And if I do throw a deobfuscation problem at you in the lab, it'll most likely be a mirror image of what we did in class um, where um, maybe one of the encoding parameters is slightly different or it might be one of the three we did in class and you have to answer the question of which of the three it is, that type of thing. 